Welcome everyone. We're going to get started here in just a second. Thanks for being here. All right, we see everybody uh, starting to uh, file in the door here. Thanks everyone for joining. Welcome. My name is Ryan Fincham and I'm gonna be your moderator for this session. I'm the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and one of the lead organizers of this webinar series along with my co-director, Jim Barbrack, our program manager, Aaron Hicks and our colleagues at the US Forest Service International Programs. Let me first provide you all a brief overview of this webinar series, and then we'll quickly get into the topic of the day, leadership and how good leadership can help us set the tone for equity and inclusion. The Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and the US Forest Service International Programs are ha happy to be offering this 2020-2021 webinar series called Protected Areas for Everyone, which is focused on protected area issues around the globe. This series already included six sessions in the fall of 2020 focused on building resilience. And now we'll be continuing with six additional webinars this spring, including three in English and three in Spanish between March and May of 2021. And this is gonna be our kickoff session for this spring where we're gonna be focusing on topics related to leadership for equity and inclusion, barriers and supports for women conservation leaders and ideas for developing universal access for protected areas. The overall purpose of this webinar series is to provide a space, a virtual space for us to continue to connect, both for our past alumni of our CSU and US Forest Service seminars and other programs, but also for new people that we'd like to welcome in um, to our network. Um, in addition, we hope that these, this space really provides us a, a place to have a conversation, to continue and to inspire us all, to ensure that protected areas are better conserved, that managers are better equipped and connected, and that our protected areas really do serve all people. And it's our hope that this webinar series will contribute in a small but meaningful way to these big goals. I see we get uh, quite a few people now joining us for the webinar. So we'd like to thank you all for being here, for joining us. We know our time, uh, especially time connected to Zoom is uh, very precious. And so we appreciate you spending some time with us um, here today. As you log in, we'd like to ask that you use the chat function to let us know where you're joining us from. So we can kind of keep, uh, keep track of, uh, of, where, of where, uh, where people are tuning in from. As we get started with our panelists, if you have specific questions for them, we'd like you uh, to ask you to use the question and answer function that Zoom has for all of your panelist questions. Um, this will help us kind of keep track of those questions and make sure we get some of those questions um, answered towards the end of the session. Um, this session is being recorded and we will provide a link to the recorded session on our webpage. Um, Jim Barbrack will be monitoring those questions as they come in and help us organize a few of those towards the end of the session to be asked to our panelists. And then Erin Hicks will be providing technical support. So feel free to reach out to her through the chat function if you're having some issue uh, with your connectivity. And we're gonna work really hard to keep this to one hour in length. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump in and get started uh, talking about leadership especially as it relates to equity and inclusion in protected areas. While racism and social justice are issues deeply rooted in our society, uh, protected area uh, agencies, conservation organizations, um, definitely have an important role to play in promoting greater diversity and inclusion in their workforce, while also expanding uh, opportunities for all visitors um, as well. Uh, this session will explore how leaders and their actions can set the tone for equity and inclusion in protected area agencies, conservation organizations, and with the populations they serve. I'll now present all three of our panelists for today and give them each a few minutes to provide us with a brief overview of their work. And then we'll jump into some more specific questions. So today we have Dr. Val Mazinas, director of the USDA Forest Service um, International Programs. Welcome Val. We have Leander Lacey, founder and CEO of Lacey Consulting Services, LLC. Thanks, Leander, for being here. 
And we have Wendy Mack, Senior Director for Research and Advisory from Culture IQ. So thanks, Wendy, from bringing us some information from the business sector to us, uh, to the conservation world. So with that in mind, uh, let's go one by one. We'll start with Val, continue with Leander, and then go on to Wendy. Um, I'd just like uh, each one of you to provide us with a brief introduction, um, who you are and what it is, where you work and what it is that you're working on these days. So we'll kick it off with you, Val. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ryan. Uh, pleasure to uh, to be here and uh, to be on this panel. We've had the Forest Service International Programs has had a really robust partnership with uh, Colorado State University for over 20 years. Uh, it's great to work uh, with uh, with the center on a whole variety of issues and on seminars and alumni engagement. Uh, the International Programs Office, uh, I'm the current director. Uh, I've been in my position for over, well, over 25 years. And uh, uh, we currently, uh, the office currently works with uh, over 90 countries around the world. Uh, we're in it for the long term. The U.S. Forest Service uh, works uh, both with developing countries and developed countries, as you probably know. Uh, we, uh, we have a workforce in the domestic forest service of about 35,000 people and manage about 10% of the U.S. land base. So we have a big domestic organization. We try to use uh, the technical expertise of our staff, domestic staff overseas for overseas engagement. We also partner with universities and NGOs. Uh, and, you know, we're in it for the long term and we're in it to exchange ideas and to learn from our engagement overseas to help internationalize our agency from overseas engagement and also bring back value uh, to the, uh, to the uh, agency itself and make a contribution overseas. I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Val. Appreciate that. Leander. Hi, everyone. I am the owner and founder of Lacey Consulting Services. Uh, we work primarily with environmental organizations and sustainability businesses, and we have three legs of our business. We do qualitative social science, we do uh, strategic planning, and we also do justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, both training and um, probably more importantly, what we're more invested in is how to incorporate that into conservation programming on the ground. And so, for instance, a recent project that we just wrapped up is working with the Conservation Measures Partnership to look at how to incorporate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into the five steps of the conservation standards, the globally accepted way of doing conservation. Um, they realized that when they did the, when they initially created those standards um, for measuring or for doing conservation, there really wasn't any diversity in the room. And so they wanted to reevaluate how they can start to incorporate that. I'm also doing environmental projects um, you know, around the world. One project, another project we, re we recently wrapped up is looking at the level of trust between fishers, law enforcement and conservation groups in the, bah in the Bahamas. And so that was a fantastic project um, that had a great report looking at how to build and sustain trust, which is a critical factor, social factor for conservation success. Um, I am also uh, the Alliance Director here in Denver, Colorado, where I live, um, for the Metro Denver Nature Alliance, looking at bringing equitable conservation throughout the seven county region of Denver Metro. And then lastly, um, I'm also a host for a podcast called The Green Mind Podcast, where I'm sure I'll talk about later, um, where we get to talk to individuals around the world who are actually looking at the intersection between human well-being and conservation outcomes. So I'll stop there. All right. So I guess we're going to continue on. The rest of this webinar will just be with Leander because we got a lot of stuff to unpack. No? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leander. Really appreciate that. Uh, Wendy. I was thinking the same, Ryan. I don't know how to follow Leander, but I'm just absolutely pleased to be here. So as Ryan mentioned, I am Wendy Mack, Senior Director of Research and Advisory for Culture IQ. I am an organization development specialist. So I have spent 25 plus years helping leaders and HR professionals transform their organizations, sometimes through the lens of learning and development, sometimes as Leander said, more through strategy. 
Um, my particular passion and focus is on change and communication during change. And as Ryan mentioned, I'm here to maybe share a couple of insights from the corporate world. My heart, as Leander and Ryan knows, lives with parks and protected areas. So it's just a delight. Um, I am a bird watcher and a wildlife tracker. So any chance I get to make a little contribution to the conservation space totally makes my day. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for joining us. And uh, it's so, so great to have all of you here and, uh, you know, discussing these issue with, issues with us today. So we really appreciate uh, your time. Um, let's, let's go ahead and jump into the conversation here. And, and Val, I'm going to direct this first question towards you. Um, you know, just thinking a little bit about this past year and the immense challenges that has affected people of all walks of life, uh, working in all sectors across all reaches of the globe. Um, it's really obviously been a challenge. And, and for the conservation sector, this pandemic has made an already difficult and sometimes dangerous job even more challenging. And you know, I'm just curious if you would be willing to share some of your insights and experience on how leadership in the Forest Service, especially leadership within international programs, um, has helped play a role in, in help, you know, maintaining perspective and, and resilience of the, of the staff uh, and focus, you know, at the job at hand and while pivoting and trying to figure out how to do things differently, you know, um, and, and, and really providing that space for adaptability and, and nurturing, you know, that, that nurturing environment that, that we've all come to realize is so important uh, for your employees. So if you would be willing to speak to that a little bit, um, uh, I think that'll get us get us started thinking about leadership in, in broad terms. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. Uh, you know, I've uh, got what five minutes to address all that, the pandemic and a few <laughs> other things, but I'll try. I'll, I will try. I'm from Chicago. I can uh, speak quickly. Uh, let me just start off with what you alluded to uh, in terms of the nurturing environment and and. Uh, and staff. I'll start off with staff. When the pandemic in 2020 came, uh, you know, when we first learned that State Department was holding up uh, travel to selected countries, we very quickly uh, basically canceled all travel for our staff going internationally to any country and all uh, travel coming into the U.S. under uh, our programs uh, from our partners. Uh, we're, you know, the number one priority, you can't really do much, uh, and we wouldn't be able to do much if we didn't keep our staff healthy and safe. And so uh, we sent everybody home, you know, said this is going to be a long haul, uh, and uh, started working virtually. Uh, also, we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, the people, uh, we have the medical aspects of the pandemic, and then we have the mental aspects and the emotional aspects of the pandemic. We had people uh, that were, uh, you know, because of childcare and because of, uh, you know, uh, schools being out, uh, that had 24-7, uh, you know, engagement with their families, and they're trying to balance work. We gave them try to say, hey, just relax, you know, take care of yourselves and your families first. And, you know, we'll, the work will be there whenever, you know, you get to it. On the other hand, at the other end of the continuum, we had people who had moved, say, to Washington to our, you know, from other places uh, that we hired, other places in the U.S., and they were in an apartment, you know, by themselves, didn't have a social network, uh, weren't able to interact with anybody. So we offered, you know, we had a lot of kind of social events virtually and uh, in our office at Jeopardy and some other things, but we also offered a counseling to our uh, employees, uh, you know, uh, online free counseling to anybody. The mental aspects of this pandemic are, are huge. I'm sure we've lost 2.5 million people worldwide to this pandemic and over half a million in the US, but, the mental aspects also are going to be huge. And when you look at the uh, rise of suicides in the United States, when you look at uh, the uh, consumption of alcohol, uh, believe me, I like to have a beer with anybody else, but you know, uh, the amount of alcohol uh, sales in, in major US cities has gone up 400%. Alcoholism is on the rise. People are you know, trapped. So our biggest thing was to take care of our people first and to, to try to give them flexibility so that they could 
you know, be resilient and come back and do their job. So that was one of the things. In, the, in terms of the U.S. Forest Service in the United States, we had, you know, our domestic 35,000 person workforce, we had major, uh, really two major challenges. One was how to fight fires on protected areas or in any other area. Uh, you, when, when you're social distancing, when you're wearing a mask, when you're we're moving crews from uh, hot spots of uh, COVID-19 into other areas, they had to, you know, quarantine and all of that. We got through that. Also in law enforcement, uh, everybody wanted to get out, get to a national forest or national park, uh, you know, and uh, try to maintain the re integrity of the resources and also the health of the uh, people recreating was a challenge for our law enforcement. So those were two things domestically that we had to work through and there were no easy answers. In terms of international programs office, we had already been uh, pretty well versed in the virtual world for our staff meetings. When we'd have an office staff meeting, we would have uh, we'd have it on GoToMeeting. We had a number of people in the US that would click in, number of people, uh, our staff overseas would click in. So when the pandemic hit, we were able to, you know, we already had pretty much the technology. We were better off than I think most offices. I would like to think that. Um, and on the virtual world, uh, you know, we started we started like everybody else with webinars, with PowerPoints, and we realized pretty soon that you had Zoom fatigue and all those other kinds of aspects. And we started learning from a lot of our NGO partners overseas. You know, we've got really some sharp NGOs that are working on all kinds of things. And uh, also our partners and consulting firms that we work with here in Washington and around the, uh, around the country. And so we've modified the webinars to where we're now doing much more, uh, you know, small group work, chats, uh, you know, interactive. So it's not just a PowerPoint. Uh, we've uh, also tried to develop networks, virtual networks. Uh, we have uh, 11 uh, international seminars. We have a lot of alumni, alumni from those seminars. We're trying to create alumni networks that are uh, ongoing, that it's not just, uh, you know, one day you have a webinar and then you wait three, three weeks, have something else. Ongoing networks that are on uh, social media or other platforms to be able to engage people where they are and on various subject matter uh, areas. We're trying to scale up uh, with our NGOs uh, in overseas, in-country networks and countries uh, you know, that are, uh, that are uh, looking at how to scale up sustainable natural resource management. Uh, we have a problem of scale in, uh, in terms of being able to address natural resources. Uh, and we're trying to develop thematic ne networks around certain technical areas. Uh, also, uh, the development of uh, platforms in training. We, through our partners, contracted with uh, talent LMS, which is a online training platform where we can house all of our training, try to develop generic and general training modules that can be custom made uh, to each individual country and that can be accessed by our rangers, by ranger, say in Brazil on their phone, uh, you know, with the appropriate translation and so forth. Uh, you know, trying to use that technology uh, we've had a you know, pretty good success on that. We hope to be doing more. Uh, we've also done some technical assistance. You know, we would send out you know, 600 or 700 uh, Forest Service people every year you know, to go overseas for two weeks or three weeks to provide technical assistance in the Ukraine. Recently, we just did it virtually. You know, somebody walking through a forest with a phone and one of our Forest Service people back here making an assessment. Uh, we also are looking at things like uh, ex uh, extension services. Uh, you know, the governments overseas and in the U.S. have problems of you know getting at the grassroots with villagers, and they don't have the extension services in terms of getting out there with a Land Rover and staff and all that. Now you can do that virtually. You can do that virtually in a district or in a, a neighborhood where there are 50 farmers or 100 farmers. Week one, you could tell them, okay, plant your seedlings. 
you know, Pat, plant your seeds. Week two, you get on with them and say, hey, I have the seedlings germinated. Week three, you, you know, so there's all these opportunities uh, to do, you know, I mean, it'd be like us going to a doctor. I mean, we used to go to doctors. Now we're doing e-doctor, you know, on Zoom. So mm -hmm. how to harness this and how to, uh, you know, after COVID, in the post-COVID era, uh, to be able to implement some of these strategies that we've learned during this uh, period. Also, on Black Lives Matter, our office, uh, you know, is trying, we've got six uh, anti-racism working groups. We're trying to, on uh, various topics, well, we are trying to integrate and, uh, anti-racism and anti-harassment modules in all our programming, uh, both technical and training and all of that. And it's a challenge, but we are making slow and steady progress. It's, you know, nobody owns the con con conversation on this. You know, everybody is a player at some level and we're trying to gauge people where they are both here in the United States and overseas. So I think I'll leave it there. Probably ran over, I apologize. No, oh, wonderful, Val. Really appreciate those uh, those contributions. And and um, it, I mean, it, you're talking about 10% of the of the U.S. land surface, and uh, you already got us, you know, one third of the way to 30 by 30. Not to mention the stuff you're doing in in 90 countries around the world. So lot, lots of information to unpack there. And the only thing I can add is that in addition to continuing to work with your staff and seeing how they've been supported, I just like to add as uh, as a partner, a long-term partner of the Forest Service, we as partners have also felt extremely supported uh, by the Forest Service International programs throughout this pandemic. So uh, we're very grateful for that as well, Val, and grateful for your leadership there. Um, Thank you. You know, one, one of the things, obviously, and you hit on this, Val, uh, in terms of the anti-racism work that you all are working on in your office, and, and we've been uh, participating as partners in some of those uh, conversations, um, is to think about that beyond you know, just the health challenges and the and the struggles that we've all faced. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Leander in here uh, to help us think through uh, some some thoughts here. Is you know we've also as you as you as you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement uh, here in the United States, which has also now expanded um, elsewhere around the globe. You know, in the midst of this pandemic, we also had this social reckoning. Um, and it wasn't a new social reckoning, but because it's been going on for a long time. But it kind of you know hit. Hit hit uh, hit its stride uh, in the summer, and 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 um, as we saw, you know, citizens protesting, demanding for social justice and racial equality, um, you know, recognizing the fact that um, societal racism is a deeply rooted issue, and starting to think about conservation, protected area agencies, NGOs, and thinking about the role that they can play in addressing equity and inclusion in their workplaces um, and in the populations they serve. Um, you know, this obviously has served for many of us as a time of reflection as we think about what happens post COVID and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious from your work, Leander, which I know lines up very, very directly in this space. Um, you know, what, what are some of the actions that leaders can take to promote um, equity and inclusion uh, within their organizations, within protected area agencies? Um, you know, what are some of the recommendations you would provide uh, for us to, to, to tackle this issue and, and, um, and, and, you know, make some advances. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. And I think that, you know, one of the first things to, to reckon with is the why. Why are you at all working on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Uh, the murder of George Floyd last year did spark a global reckoning around, you know, understanding how oppressed communities are being, you know, being treated. And I think it's, it was a global spark because it's not that it's not that everyone's like, oh, we really are invested in American or United States relations around racial issues. I think it's um, oppressed communities are just fed up and they saw one oppressed community and like, we can't, we're tired. And so we're going to protest about this. And so by helping one oppressed community, even if it's in a different country where that's not the same issue for them at all, um, you know, there are still issues of police brutality, of oppression, of discrimination. And so folks are addressing this as best they can in, in other countries as well. And so when we talk about the why, I think there's two things to consider here. One, um, a, a big challenge that conservation groups have um, that is an important first step towards healing and to really being authentic in this space 
is understanding how they have contributed to that oppression of peoples. And unless you acknowledge your own oppression and what you've done in this space, you can't then be a speakerphone to try and say, we care about oppression. Um, you know, it's, it's about, you know, that then it sounds like you're trying to get into integration, you're trying to get them to assimilate without having ever acknowledged your part and participation in the oppression of people. And that seems very awkward to a lot of folks, but that's pretty primarily awkward to the dominant culture, um, because they are the ones in some way that have historically contributed to this. But this, the, the need to reckon and the need to understand and to, um, to clear out your history is to be able to say, we understand, we see you, we recognize you. It's not for you, it's for the people you're trying to bring into the, the conversation around com conservation. And so then we get into the, why would you do that? Um, you know, Why would you spend all that energy and why would you invest all that time to do this work? And so the reason, the number one reason that we see is that in order for people to engage in conservation, it's somewhat of a privilege to be able to come home and say, you know what, I think I'm gonna think about a complex issue like uh, climate change, um, because I don't have to worry about whether or not my family will be fed tonight. I don't have to worry about whether or not um, I'm going to go out for a drive and someone's gonna pull me over and I might get shot today. You don't have to worry about um, you know, going out to the bar and kissing your lover and then someone calling you, you know, inappropriate words because you're gay or lesbian or whatever. Those are the mental gymnastics that you're dealing with that, that prohibits you from engaging in the conservation field. And so the reason why it's so critical for us to engage in, this, in these issues is because we need to get everyone, globally, everyone has to be at the table. We're not doing any of this work for just a few people. We're doing this for everyone on this planet. And if that is the case, everyone needs to be engaged in some way. And so we need to help remove barriers um, social barriers so that they can start to engage in these environmental conversations that have that are critically affecting their lives, but they can't see it, you know, you can't see the forest for the tree or something like that, and is, uh, is the term. And so if you're looking at just at the tree, you can't see the whole forest. And so it's important for us to start um, eliminating those barriers and acknowledging our history in, 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 in perpetuating that problem. Um, and so that's, those are some of the things that I would say to, to conservation organizations is to begin to really start evaluating your, your role in this. And I know that, as I mentioned earlier, um, so two great examples of that. Um, so the, the, the Nature Conservancy here in the United States, they're looking at how to be actively anti-racist in their North America agriculture program. Um, and so they've historically excluded um, black, indigenous, people of color, farmers and ranchers, and not for any other reason than the fact that they've just worked in areas that happen to not really have those folks there because they're looking for uh, large landowners and large acres, and that's who they tend to have worked with um, historically. And while that is great, that wording actually is even rooted in discrimination, right? It's the idea that we're only gonna work with large landowners automatically takes out um, uh, black indigenous people of color because they tend to have not have those large swaths of land to be able to engage in that space. And so there's a lot to be reckoned with and there are a lot of um, great organizations that are starting to realize the need for this. Um, and they are starting to state out loud how they've contributed to discrimination. And those who have taken that bold step have gotten immensely positive feedback and, have, and are more trustworthy than the organizations that don't have those sort of statements. So I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I just want to pause there. Yeah, yeah I th I th that's great, Leander. I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of good ideas there, um, and I'm sure there's you can give us a whole a whole a whole lot more um, because uh, like you know we can we can do a whole webinar series on this topic, and we and we should. Um, uh, you know, I think I think one of the things is just as you kind of alluded to is 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 sometimes there's organizations that just feel a little slightly bit uncomfortable as they start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, as they're not really sure. You know, they want they don't want to they don't want to you know they walk it on eggshells. They don't want to say the wrong thing. You know, there's just a, there's a really heightened level of sensitivity because um, you know there's a, there's a lot of details in the words we use, and sometimes we use words inadvertently and and you know make mistakes. And I think it sounds like you know at least partially partially what you're saying is like you know jump in um, and and get started and and not don't just wait for the perfect time or the perfect way or be perfectly prepared. Um, it's going to require a lot of work over a lot of time. 
and there's, you know, you're out there working in this space. There's lots of organizations, individuals and consulting firms that are working in this space that can help us help us all kind of, you know, uh, start to start to make positive moves in the right direction. Yeah, can I just say one last thing? So whenever you're feeling uncomfortable, remember that while you're feeling uncomfortable, people are not able to feed their family or having physical violence against them. So you just feel awkward, but your Mm -hmm. awkwardness does not compare to what these individuals are facing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, Well, uh, let's, uh, there's there's lots to talk about. Um, I I, I do want to, go to Wendy, have asked Wendy to join us. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I've always appreciated your, your thoughts and insights, Wendy, coming mm-hmm. from a business background, working primarily with corporations, um, sometimes in conservation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we just talk to people in conservation and we don't spread out um, mm-hmm. and, and learn from other people. Um, and so I'm kind of curious from, you know, from your experience, if you could share some insights, you know, related to good leadership practices from the business sector that we might adopt, learn from in conservation. And, and specifically, I'm thinking about, you know, mm-hmm. leadership skills or approaches that might help us, you know, set the tone for, for equity and inclusion. I know a lot of your work is mm-hmm. done around the change space. Right. And obviously, kind of what Leander has just helped us start to unpack is that there's some sta- substantial change we need to be making in conservation around equity and inclusion. So um, I- I'd love to hear your thoughts. Gosh, so much to say, of course, like uh, our two previous speakers said. I think for me, what I'm really noticing, and, and this relates back to what is hopeful, is that corporations are starting to have the kinds of conversations that Leander just spoke about. Corporations are moving beyond having training events or diversity programs and starting to open up and being willing to acknowledge there are inequities in place. It wasn't intentional, but they're still there. And we owe it to ourselves and to each other to do something about that. And we're just beginning, really. I think there are some amazing companies out there, Salesforce, GE, Genentech, who are doing remarkable work. Um, And Ryan, I can share with you and Aaron a link to some articles about what some corporations are doing. Um, But net net, I see a couple of big shifts in the last 20 years and even more in the last year. Um, One is companies are understanding that diversity, equity, and inclusion are not the same thing. We have this tendency to jump them all together, right? And then say, okay, we're going to do something about it. Each has a distinct meaning and each requires different action. A second positive evolution I'm seeing is, again, moving away from isolated events. And I've been in the training industry my whole life. I remember literally in the 1990s delivering diversity training to some of my clients. And it was a disaster. It didn't do any good. It just made people mad, right? Because we didn't know what we were doing at that point. And so now it's very encouraging to me to see companies like Salesforce, forming a whole task force on racial justice and equity. And then they're establishing systematic change efforts. Um, (laughs) I don't know if if your world does that. In the corporate world, people like pillars. So uh, Genentech has three pillars of their program. Uh, Salesforce has four pillars of their program. Kind of funny, but what I think that shows us is that they're thinking across their systems and not just about we're gonna do one thing one time. Um, from a leadership perspective, I think you, you definitely expressed this point that leaders set the stage, leaders build the culture. So if we want our cultures to change, it's got to start with our leaders and then be embodied throughout. And what I think is positive there is um, people used to say, oh, okay, well, it's up to the individual managers to create an inclusive environment and leave it at that. And then these poor individual managers had to guess at what does that mean? And so now I'm seeing more evidence that companies in the business sector are breaking it down very clearly and saying, okay, if you're a frontline leader, your job is to create an inclusive environment. And the behaviors that you use to do that are to look around the room and see who's missing look around the room and see if everybody has spoken. Make sure that it's psychologically safe to present an alternative point of view. So I think, you know, net net when I when I look at what's happening in the business world, what's really encouraging to me is it it feels like we're finally starting to get real 
and address real behaviors that promote an environment that's safe and that's welcoming and starting to understand that we've got to be partnering. I love Val, all of your examples. I had no idea 35,000 people in the Forest Service. I mean, think about change on that scale. And what we're starting to do is have these business, um, not-for-profit, NGO, all these different relationships. And, uh, you know, I just listened to this great podcast about change and that change really happens whenever two disparate points of view come together and connect and then something big happens. So hearing about the kinds of relationships our other panelists are building that you're building, I think is, is going to be a critical hinge point so that we can make this positive change truly real and not what it was in the 90s. Wonderful. Um, you know, I, I do want to make sure we have some time for, you know, success stories and kind of I li like to walk out of here with some stories of hope. And, and you guys have already alluded to some of those. But before we jump into those, I'd just like to pause for a second. And, you know, after hearing from Val, Leander, Wynn, if, if either of you have any other comments you'd like to make uh, or reactions to what you've heard uh, from our other panelists, I'd just like to provide a pause here. Um, and 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 give you a space to to to, to chime in, especially Val. You 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 had you you had to jump out first there, so you you didn't have the benefit of uh, of hearing everybody else's comments. I mean, you know, thinking about what Leander's talked about and kind of what he's working on, and 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 you know, some of the experience that Wendy mentioned from the corporate world. Any thoughts coming coming to you from from you know the Forest Service and and and, and kind of what next steps are for you all? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think in our kind of pre-meeting, we're, uh, we're looking forward to having an outside assessment of our current practices, an independent assessment from uh, a third party about what we should be doing uh, in terms of integrating and systematizing, you know, uh, our programs. And it's not just in our office, but, you know, how we relate overseas and how we uh, how we show up overseas. And, you know, there are a lot of tribal areas. There are a lot of minorities. Uh, you look at what's going on in India with the Muslim population under the, you know, Modi. I mean, there's, there's a whole, you know, how do you address that? And, you know, and also at the same time be so-called culturally sensitive, you know, and uh, at the grassroots level. And what kind of organizations can we partner with that are advocates at the grassroots level? Uh, you know, and those kinds of things. So I think, I think, uh, you know, I was around for the diversity training in the, in the eighties, Wendy. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was like a, an add on, you know, okay. You know, we checked the box and mm -hmm. we've got to do better. We've got to do better on the systems and, and, and in, you know, integrating it into our day-to-day, -day, you know, into our day-to-day -day lives. Also, I think one of the functions of leaders also, you can set the stage, but one way of setting the stage that I learned in conservation and ecology is you manage for the environment. You manage the, you know, set the environment and the inhabitants, whether they're biodiverse or they're humans, are gonna, they're gonna do stuff. It'll be messy, but they'll, you know, set the environment and people and the, uh, the inhabitants of the environment will take charge and do things if you can set the proper tone. And that's something I think also, uh, there's a lot of stuff saying, well, leadership needs to do this and leadership needs to do that. We're, we're, uh, one of the things leadership needs to do is set the environment so people can thrive in it. I think that's mm -hmm. the other aspect. It's not like we have a top down and this is a genius and a thousand helper management model. No, mm -hmm. everybody's in it. I'll leave mm -hmm. it there. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's great about it. And really, I think that speaks a lot to what, what we've been reading a lot about in terms of transformational leadership, in terms of, of how, you, how you get that leadership, uh, really not, not just leadership in terms of who's the decision maker, but leadership as, as, a, as a tool that empowers all people in an organization to make those changes. And so that's great. Well, you know, you guys have already touched on some success stories or stories of hope, but I'd like to open it back up as we, as we start to, uh, to close out here. And, and, and we will save some time at the very end for questions from the audience. But, um, you know, it, are there any additional kind of stories of hope or, 
or success stories that you've observed in your work where steps towards equity and inclusion are being taken? Obviously, you've shared those within your own work, but I'm just kind of, you know, it's basically, you know, what, what gives you hope for the future uh, when it comes to equity and inclusion? And I'll start with you, Val, and we'll go through. Yeah, thank you. I think that the, uh, you know, some of the networks that we're uh, currently developing at the, uh, you know, at the grassroots level with our NGO partners overseas, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to address uh, issues for the long term. We're going to be working in with these partners for a long, uh, over a long period of time. We have 17 NGOs that we work with uh, currently. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of NGOs, but we've got 17 that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And to, to get them uh, working with us and exchange ideas about situations in their country with relation, uh, relative to anti-racism, uh, anti-harassment, you know, bullying. I mean, it's all, you know, those are issues that we have to deal with. We're, we do also a lot of law enforcement training uh, overseas on protected areas, you know, how do, how do the law enforcement overseas deal with communities and community policing and the, you know, the subcultures within, uh, within the uh, you know, uh, buffer zones of protected areas and all that. So we're trying to also look at those things. Uh, I think the network approach is, is one that we're looking at and we're trying to kind of systematize. So I'll leave it there on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you, Val. Leander, what, what makes you hopeful for the future? Yeah, um, I would say there's probably, there's two things I think of. Um, one, the, the project I mentioned earlier about uh, integrating justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into the conservation standards. In order for me to do that project, I had to interview conservation organizations around the world that are incorporating those topics into conservation programming to truly understand how they are engaging in this space. And while there is a lot still to be done, and we're still being exclusionary to some groups still, um, there is hope in that we are doing the work. Um, it is happening globally. There are organizations that have started to broach this topic and are starting to do something about it. And so it is good to hear those stories and to be able to document it for people to see because one of the kind of pitfalls is that people are all recreating the same failures because no one's sharing their failures and so uh, globally, everyone's doing the exact same failure over and over and over again, because everyone's afraid to share their failure. Um, so I'm hopeful that people will start to share those stories out so that we can stop doing that. And then the second thing is, um, as I mentioned earlier, is I'm, I'm the host for a podcast called The Green Mind. And that podcast is all about having interviewing individuals around the world who are doing something at the intersection of human well-being and environmental outcomes. So there are people out there and being able to interview them and have them um, as guests really gives me hope for the future, just to see that people are not just paralyzed with fear and awkwardness, um, they're actually doing something about it in the world. Wonderful, thanks, thanks Leander. Um, Wendy, what, what, uh, what makes you hopeful? Yeah, so I talked a little bit about some of the success stories we're seeing from corporations, um, but I'm going to flip it because I think what makes me most hopeful is I feel like in the last year, we've had this convergence of events where we're starting to break open in a vulnerable way and have meaningful conversations. Um, one of the movements that I see is we are helping, um, we're not, we're stopping talking to people and saying you should respect diversity and, and you know, don't tell bad jokes about somebody. We've moved so far beyond that. And we're now saying, let's create an experience where you can feel what it feels like to feel unsafe or unwelcome. And when we get at that level of depth, I think we're going to then couple that systems, that top-down change with individual change. Um, and, and I'll just share a vulnerable example of my own. I have a certain privilege. I expect certain things in my public spaces and parks. So to me, it's about being uh, out in nature and being quiet and being able to hear the birds. And I'll, I'll be honest, if somebody walked past me playing a lot of music or had a loud gathering, I would have been all indignant and said, you're, you know, you're stepping on my public space. 
but the more learning I've done, Diversity Outdoors, Ryan, some of what you're reading is making me stop and think, wait a minute, if my culture values community and events and socializing is important to me, there's got to be a place for that in the park. So I think, you know, I've heard people talk about do the work yourself. Um, and I have far to go, but I think more of us are slowing down and questioning our own assumptions and being willing to do this, the work ourselves so that we never make somebody feel that discomfort, feel unsafe or feel unwelcome. Great, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for that example. Um, uh, I do think there's lots of things to be hopeful for. Um, and um, I'd just like to add that I, 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 I hope <laughs> that the idea of hope is also something that everybody can everybody can embrace because I have worked with people that have you know been in projects with um, with um, with lower income kids for example and, and going through an exercise about visioning and and what are your dreams and there's all of a sudden this disconnect you know about what do you mean about dreaming like like I'm just trying to get through to the next day you know and all of a sudden, sometimes you know these concepts of of hope and this and that there's people still, you know, our neighbors that maybe don't even feel like they have the ability to hope or dream or to vision a different future because of the struggles that they're facing today. And so I just think anything we can continue to do to build our own awareness, um, our, our, our individual awareness, you know, our collective group awareness, and then the awareness of the system that we're working in is just going to help us bring um, hopefully better, better benefits for all in protected areas. Um, are not going to be around um, uh, to continue to provide the environmental service and to continue to provide space for all the other creatures that share the planet with us if we don't um, do a better job of making them feel be to become protected areas for everyone you know and that's like some people often that don't work in the protected area space come to us and say you work in protected areas who are you protecting them from and then you know so it's part of that narrative is we, we need to change that narrative no, these are these are not protected from people these are protected for people um, and and um, there's, obviously we have some work um, and acknowledgement of the past because not all protected areas have been created for all people. And we need to change that um, going forward into the future. Um, I'd like to uh, see if Jim Barbarak might be able to join us here on the line. Hopefully you're still there, Jim, um, and see if uh, there's any questions that have come in from the audience that you might be able to direct towards our panelists. Thanks, Ryan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, from about 20 different countries around the world that are participating. The first question, and I'll uh, see uh, who wants to take this one, it could apply to any of you. And it's the following uh, from an anonymous uh, uh, question. And it says that in, in their country, indigenous peoples are still traditional managers of many wildlands and protected areas. And yet government tends to ignore them and not accept their role. And uh, for uh, all of our listeners, there have been a number of studies in the last five years or so that have shown that around the world, indigenous people actually are better land stewards than official government uh, managers or NGO co-managers in many cases, because they really have a stake in the land. So the question is, what can be done to uh, create a recognition, acknowledgement by government and to change policies to formally recognize the role of traditional stewards? And the question was specifically about indigenous people, but in many other places, it's traditional peoples who may not qualify under the moniker indigenous, but communities that have lived in a place for hundreds of years and have managed the land and its resources, but that do not have tenure, do not have a recognition of their resource rights by government. So that could be for any one of our speakers. Wow. That's a, that's a challenging question. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, if anybody has, uh, uh, um, uh, an idea on that one. I, I, I do think, you know, Val, um, as, a, as somebody that works with and represents a land management agency, um, you might have some interesting reflections. Sure. Uh, you know, in the United States, traditional knowledge, we in the Forest Service recognize traditional knowledge from our Native American c communities. We've got literature and, uh, you know, and uh, basically relationships with all the tribes in terms of uh, stewardship uh you know probably uh, we can do better on that just like we can do on any other uh, programs that we're running but over and so we have some experience on that with uh with native peoples i think the the basic thing is uh you know we're government 
But over the last you know, 15 years, we've uh, in international programs done more and more with NGOs. And part of it is just that, you know, that get closer to the ground. We can work with the government, but it's, uh, you know, 90% energy loss at every trophic level. If you're looking at the ecological pyramid, uh, by the time you get down to the grassroots. So we're working at the grassroots level. There are NGOs that are working with individuals, I mean, with, with, with native communities, uh, tribals uh, overseas. Uh, there are organizations, uh, you know, many uh, folks don't have land title or any, you know, any kind of, I mean, that's a, there's a off, NGO called Rights and Resources. Uh, advocacy, there are advocacy groups in every country advocating um, policy changes with the government for for the rights of indigenous folks. We need to strengthen those. We're trying to, you know, seek those out, try to work with folks uh, on that, you know, uh, because it is, I mean, uh, I don't know what the statistic is, but 25 or 30% of the poorest people in, United, in, the, in the world live in forested landscapes and uh, don't have rights, don't have resources. And you know, we need to be able to, to work with organizations, NGOs, and other advocacy groups to be able to address that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Val. So, Ryan, we have another question from Audrey Exomas, our former colleague here at CSU. Hi, Audrey. And it's a question specifically for Leander. And she asked the following, Leander, I love the work you're doing looking at instances where diversity, equity, inclusion is being successfully integrated into conservation organizations. Uh, her organization, uh, which is an NGO, is really just at the beginning of this process. And she would like think she would benefit from seeing both success and failure. Uh, will some of that research be made public at some point, both on the case studies of success, but also on case studies of failure? Yeah, absolutely. So that report is done, completed, is meant for practitioners, is written in a way for practitioners. Um, we, I did a webinar on it a few weeks ago and uh, the report is ready to go. So I can send it over to Ryan and, um, they, can, and they can send it out to everyone um, that has attended. Uh, we're trying our best to promote it. Um, we're not finding it's easy to promote certain things because it's not like there's one network for all conservation groups, unfortunately. Um, which again leads to the concern about sharing out these failure stories because how do you get them out in a way that effectively reaches everyone who needs to hear it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please feel free and I, uh, Leander to send those our way. And um, Wendy, you mentioned some resources, some readings as well. Um, you know, please feel free to share those with me and we'll get those pushed out to, um, to everyone here and, and, and hang them on our website as well so that people can have access to them um, as follow-up uh, reading. Jim? So this next question is from Lucrecia Ma Masaya of Guatemala of International Programs of the Forest Service and it's for Val. But I also like to ask Wendy to answer this one from a corporate standpoint about corporate responsibility in this regard. Uh, we have been benefiting the United States uh, from having one of the highest percentages of people already vaccinated in our country, even compared to Europe, and certainly compared to most countries. Until recently, the US government actually had not signed on to a global program to, uh, to ensure uh, vaccine equity. Uh, but now we have, fortunately. Uh, but still, there's tremendous disparities in access to vaccines around the world. And it's been said by many of the world's greatest uh, uh, health experts, including the WHO, our famous Dr. Fauci, that uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, egotism and not spreading it basically just ensures that the disease will be around for a lot longer uh, period of time. It's a no one's benefit that there be inequity in vaccine distribution. So the question from Lucrecia is about how do organizations like USFSIP, which has employees around the world and has partners around the world, contribute to this? <clears throat> and Wendy, in your case, how about corporations that have much of their workforce in the global south and that all of their workforce in the global north is going to be getting vaccines in a few weeks, and yet the real, the, most of their workforce in developing countries is still waiting to hear when vaccines will even arrive in their country? How do we contribute as conservationists to that particular equity issue? Yeah, what what I can say on on vaccine uh, on vaccine equity is that uh, uh, 
you know, I, I think you'll, you'll see from the uh, Biden administration a huge push, a, a huge push on, on getting vaccine, vaccines out globally through USAID and uh, the Foreign Assistance Program. I think you'll see a, a lot of that just because we have to. I mean, we have to get, this is a global problem. And if we're gonna tap down the variants that are out there, uh, we need to be able to do that. Uh, I think the, the other thing is in terms of each individual country, you know, how that's distributed. Uh, we have our problems in the United States in Washington, DC, we've now moved to zip code, uh, you know, trying to, you know, we have poor statistics. Uh, maybe we have 50% of our data missing in terms of who's getting the vaccines, uh, national reporting. And so now we've moved into a, you know, into a zip code area. But uh, I think from the United States, I think the United States under our current administration will do that. I think our view is that, you know, it, it depends on each individual country, how they're distributing in there. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, when we're signing agreements with countries, there'll be an equity pro provision in there. Uh, that's probably not my, my lane to comment on. I don't know exactly, you know, how that plays out, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, and Jim, I so appreciate the question. I'll have to echo Val here that really not my lane. Now I'm fascinated and I wanna go out and look and see what corporations are doing to ensure equitable access to vaccines. And if they can, my hypothesis is that they've gotta be forming close relationships with the, you know, the healthcare systems in different countries, um, very US centric, but what I'm seeing here in the States is the HR professionals are trying desperately to figure out what they can require and should they require. And, and it's a delicate balance of, I mean, even you have the question of people who don't wanna get vaccine, companies are struggling with, should we insist that everybody does? Should we insist that they do if they come back to the office? So um, somebody used the term messy middle earlier. And I think uh, from a corporate perspective, we are big time in the messy middle trying to figure out our point of view on vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think you know one of the things that this question does uh, bring to our attention is the fact that uh, you know equity inclusion is going to be something that's going to be around with us and it's going to continue to evolve. There's going to be new ways we need to to think about equity and inclusion. We've got to keep working on the issues that have always been here that are that are that have been perpetuated, but always keep our eye towards um, new areas of of equity inclusion as well. Well, thanks, Jim, for bringing in those questions. And um, thank you all um, for uh, your, um, your thoughts, uh, your inspiration, your motivation, your example, um, all of what you're, you're doing in, in the different parts of, of the world where you're working and in the different sectors that you're working in. Um, I think we'd go ahead, like to go ahead and bring this, uh, start to bring this session to closure. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Val. Thanks, Leander. Thanks, Wendy. I think you've left us all with inspiration and motivation to keep working towards uh, a more equitable and inclusive world. And, and we hope that many of our participants that are joining us from around the world um, are also leading inspired and, uh, and, uh, and ready to take action. Um, for all of our participants, um, for our past seminar uh, participants from the US Forest Service and, and CSU seminars, thank you for joining us. For, for folks from other Forest Service seminars, we're glad uh, you, you were able to participate. And for the broader network that's, that's joining us today, uh, we hope you enjoyed this session and will con uh, consider joining us for future webinars that are gonna be part of this series. Um, and we hope we'll also be continuing on into the future. Um, remember please that our next webinar we're gonna take, is gonna take place this Thursday on this same topic, but will be held in Spanish um, with a different set of, uh, of, uh, of panelists. Um, and then on April 6th and April 8th, we're gonna have our next English and Spanish sessions that's gonna be focusing on barriers and supports uh, for women conservation leaders. And you can see um, information about those sessions um, on the screen um, now. Um, I think Aaron already put into the chat uh, a post webinar uh, survey we appreciate you filling that out so we can gather information about new sessions and better ways to engage. Um, so we appreciate you, you filling that out. It's, I promise it won't take you more than a few minutes. Um, and um, other than that, thanks again to our team at CSU. 
and to all of our collaborators at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs for making this session possible. And we hope you all have a great day. Um, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.